50 years ago, a landmark book was published, Born Free. It told the story of how the Adamsons, an Austrian artist and British game warden, brought up an orphaned lion cub and released her back into the wilds of Kenya. There have been many stories about people and wild animals, but never quite like this one. The book became an international bestseller, selling millions of copies, and was given the Hollywood treatment. It changed a generation's attitude towards wildlife and turned the Adamsons into one of the world's first conservation superstars. Joy Adamson and her book were probably the first time that there was a major shift of opinion. Alongside this romantic image lay a different story that didn't have a happy ending. Of life lived in a beautiful but harsh landscape, alongside violent animals and the constant threat of murderous bandits that ended with Joy and George being killed. And the shot that actually killed him was when they were firing at him from behind. Today, the Adamson story is held up as a symbol of how humans can live alongside wild animals, but it continues to fiercely divide opinion. There will always be people who want fairy stories. Why not? But the natural world is more complex than that. Africa, bloody, primitive, lustful, still ruled by fang and claw, tawny kings of slaughter. Before Born Free was published, Europeans had a very particular view of Africa. It was the dark continent, inhabited by exotic and dangerous animals, where only the brave dared to go. Either you shot big game, which was regarded as being very honourable and adventurous and noble and manly, and if you could, get a record with the longest horns or the heaviest weight. Or you went in with lassoes and captured things and brought them back and showed them as monsters of the jungle. When I was a child, I'd go to the cinema and see animal films, but they were always films about animals being shot by very brave, big game hunters mowing down an elephant. And I found this disgusting, but people seem to find it rather thrilling. This one-dimensional image of wildlife was painted while Kenya was still part of the British Empire. George and Joy were mavericks in this colonial world, where wild animals were just a commodity. But the book Joy was about to write would overturn conventional attitudes to so-called savage beasts, insisting that you could have a meaningful relationship with them. The Born Free story started in 1942, when George and Joy first met at a Christmas party on the Tana River in northern Kenya. Joy was with her husband, Peter Bally, and George was taking a break from living the lonely life of a game warden in the Kenyan bush. After the party, they all went off on safari together, where Joy and George got to know each other better. When we got to Jara, I realised that uh, Joy and myself were falling in, in love with each other. And this created a very embarrassing situation. About a month later, I had to go to Nairobi to report to the chief game warden. And I made up my mind on no account would I uh, see anything of Joy. So I went to a hotel and booked a room. As I came out of the door, who did I see but Joy? And that was the end of all my good intentions. Joy divorced her husband and within a week married George. They often travelled together in the bush. This was unusual for a Western woman because of the dangers from bandits and wildlife. But her desire to do so was fueled by an insatiable curiosity for the natural world and a real talent as an artist. Joy was obviously attracted to George for his lifestyle and the places that he went and the area that he covered and the sort of quiet man that he was. 
And he obviously admired her ability to be able to keep up on these walks that he went through the bush. Just imagine it, all these other colonial people had married these very nice ladies from England with sort of Laura Ashley dresses and would sit there doing their knitting. And here was this absolute lunatic from Austria. As game warden, George looked after the northern frontier of Kenya, a region the size of the British Isles. At this time, the Europeans had bagged Kenya's most fertile land for agriculture. Reserves were set aside for wildlife. But as they were unfenced, conflict between the animals and local pastoralists was inevitable. And George Adamson was there to keep the peace. His job was to protect the habitat that had been set aside for wildlife, but he was also charged with dealing with conflict issues between local people and the animals that he was protecting. So on occasion he would have to shoot a lion that had raided cattle or was a threat to, to human life. In 1956, George was out tracking a lion that had killed and eaten his game scout's brother when his assistant was confronted by a hostile lioness. Suddenly I saw him turn, look under the rock and, and fire his rifle. And at that moment, a lioness dashed out straight at him. I couldn't shoot because he was in my line of fire. But luckily, the game scout fired, and that uh, caused the lioness to turn. And as she turned, I managed to shoot her. The lioness was found to be in milk, meaning there were almost certainly cubs nearby. George and his assistant immediately set about trying to find them. Finally, we located the, the cubs in a, in a cleft in the rock. And they were right deep inside, we couldn't reach them. And had to cut a, a fork stick with a bit of a hook on the end, and finally we got these cubs out. George brought the three cubs back to Joy for her to look after. She wanted to keep all of them, but in the end, she was only allowed to keep one, Elsa. The other two were sent off to a zoo. The extraordinary archival record of their life with Elsa exists because Joy and George had the foresight to shoot dozens of reels of cine film. The Adamsons wanted to return Elsa to the wild and were determined to release her while she was still young. One major obstacle stood in the way though. Elsa couldn't hunt for herself. So Joy and George set about teaching her, improvising along the way. George began by killing animals in front of Elsa and getting her to take possession of them. This then progressed to dragging carcasses behind their car. Eventually, Elsa graduated to killing for herself, and the Adamsons felt she was now equipped to live free and perhaps one day mate in the wild. This achievement was remarkable in itself. But when Elsa was released, instead of disappearing into the wilderness, she came back and regularly visited the Adamsons. Was it possible these savage beasts were actually able to have friendships with humans? An already extraordinary relationship was made unique when one day she arrived at the Adamsons camp with three cubs in tow. News of this remarkable story started to spread when a young David Attenborough was invited to visit the Adamsons. My cameraman colleague, Geoffrey Mulligan, and I were fortunate enough to be invited by the Adamsons out to Kenya. We arrived at the end of the dry season, when the whole of Kenya was dry and bare and dusty. They were not at all what I had thought. George was very gruff. He grunted and, uh, okay, and that sort of thing. And Joy was extreme, and, and extremely brusque and rude to him. I didn't hear her being affectionate to him at all. Come on, Elsa. 
tensions between Joy and George were heightened even more because Elsa and her cubs had just disappeared. Joy said that Elsa had been fighting with another female that was trying to take over her territory. And Joy said to George, you must go out and shoot it. It wasn't exactly the animal lover figure that I thought I'd come to see. And George was very gruff and saying, and then it got very violent, and it's so embarrassing, I got up and left. Elsa turned up and strolled into the camp, and Joy was in ecstasy. Her beloved animal had returned. Elsa, come on, come on. Joy rushed and embraced Elsa and said, Jinjambuzi, Jinjambuzi. And, and I, I thought, because <laughs> I don't speak Swahili, I thought that meant she was calling it a ginger pussy or something. But no, it means kill a goat. And so while Joy was going, oh, my dear Elsa, at the back there were the blood-curdling sounds of a goat uh, having its throat cut. And then, with the hot blood still gouting from its throat, this shuddering body was dragged in and chained to a stump so that Elsa could toy with it. It was uncharted territory, and the Adamsons' relationship with Elsa raised many questions in Attenborough's mind. There is certainly a contradiction between thinking that one individual animal um, is so important um, that you will kill other individual animals in order to support that animal. But Elsa was the centre of Joy's world. I can't explain really my relation to Elsa because it is something I can't compare. I have never had the deep love in the purest sense of the word with any human being before. The truth about Joy is that she always wanted unconditional love, which probably no human being is ever quite capable of evoking in somebody else. Uh, but I think she felt that she had it with Elsa. One interpretation of this extraordinarily strong relationship was that Elsa had become the child that Joy and George never had. Desmond Morris, the then curator for mammals at London Zoo, believed the real reasons were more complex. I've heard people say that Elsa was uh, like a child to Joy, but she was bigger than Joy. She wasn't really a child figure. I think she was, uh, it sounds strange to say this, but I think she was, I don't mean this physically, but she was Joy's lover. Joy was in love with Elsa. It was, it was a loving, almost erotic relationship. Joy wanted to tell the world about rehabilitating Elsa back into the wild and the extraordinary relationship they had. To do this, she decided to write a book and went to Desmond Morris for some advice. She didn't walk in, she padded like a lioness. And she was carrying um, a pile of photo albums like this, great big tower of albums. And she put them on my desk and said, I want you to help me with my lioness. And I said, well, what can I do? She said, look at these. So I, I took the first album, I opened it, and there was a picture of her with an adult lioness uh, in a fond embrace. And I turned the page, and there was another photograph of her in a fond embrace with a lioness. And I went on and on, and I went through all these albums, and there were thousands of pictures of her, almost all of them, uh, in a fond embrace with a lioness. And I said, well, how can I help? And she said, I want to write a book about it, and you must help me. I said, well, I, honestly, I don't think there's a plot there that would make a book. So she picked up her albums and, and, and sort of padded out and said she would go and find somebody who could help her. And she went round various publishers and they all told her the same story. Uh, I wasn't the only one who got it wrong. <laughs> but boy, did we get it wrong. Undeterred by this knockback, Joy returned to Kenya and wrote Born Free, sometimes drawing on George's copious diaries for reference. <laughs> 
The finished manuscript was rejected by dozens of publishers because they didn't think the public would be interested in their story. Joy's luck finally changed when she visited one of the founders of Harville Press. One morning in 1959, I came into our office and saw a lady sitting at my desk. She said, I'm Joy Adamson, and I brought you a bestseller. She was holding a rather dog-eared manuscript. When I'd heard the extraordinary history of Elsa, I was as sure as she was that this really was a bestseller. What was different about Born Free was that nobody had written about an intense personal relationship with a wild animal like this before. There were fictional stories like The Jungle Book, but this was real. Something else was also different about this book for its time. Photos that graphically showed the Adamson's relationship with Elsa. The pictures in Born Free are attractive because they do imply a kind of the lion lying down with the lamb, a possibility of a direct personal link between a, a person, a human, and another animal in, and a predator. And that was very attractive, and I suppose that fitted with a, a 1960s environmentalism that put people into nature, that talks about the relations between people and nature as, as very close and not one of dominance. The timing of Born Free also coincided with a wave of public interest in all things wild. A new genre of natural history television programmes had created the perfect environment into which this book was published. Television was introducing people to animals. David Attenborough was doing Zoo Quest for BBC, I was doing Zoo Time. Uh, for ITV and Armin and Mikhail were doing On Safari. Suddenly people were discovering natural history in a way that they never had before. The cinema had never really done this for them. Then, just as we thought we had enough of her full this, she showed her profile. Surely the most abnormal and freakish wine or horn ever seen. It was a period when people were uh, ready to see animals more as uh, fascinating creatures to be studied and looked at and observed, rather than wild beasts to be hunted down. But this new genre of television programme took quite a simplistic approach. The advantage television had was that you could do it in, in half-hour lumps. And in a half-hour section, you can say, look, this is an elephant, isn't that lovely? Oh, and by the way, over here is a rhinoceros, uh, and over there is a giraffe. And you kept doing it. You didn't actually need a, a, a coherent story, a dramatic line, necessarily, to get people interested in, in the wildlife. And now what came along was, having got that interest in, and you've seen the landscape, now you've got a dramatic story. Well, the book turned out to be um, a quite extraordinary bestseller. I don't know, it was probably translated into 20, 30 languages, uh, and it's sold millions of copies all over the world. And I think after the first five years, Joy earned the equivalent of five or ten million to dollars in today's money. This enormous success made the Adamsons globally famous but it was starting to take its toll on their already brittle marriage. Before Elsa, they would often spend long periods of time apart, but while she was around, the Adamsons stayed together for the longest period of time in their whole marriage. After Elsa died from tick fever in 1961, a heartbroken Joy and George began to spend most of their time apart. Joy immediately went on a worldwide lecture tour promoting the book, while George stayed in Kenya. With the marriage in difficulty, Joy feared that George would leave her. So she tightened her grip on the millions that the book was generating and refused to share any of the royalties with George. <laughs> 
Joy donated most of the money to a charity she had set up to fund various conservation projects in Kenya. But it wasn't just here that the impact of Elsa's story was being felt. It was starting to unleash a cultural phenomenon all over the Western world. When I was uh, making my television programs called Zoo Time, uh, I, I often set a competition. And uh, one of the competitions was when I asked children to send me a painting of their favorite animal. And I got a lot of lions. And believe it or not, I still have some of these today. I found them in an old cupboard. Before Elsa, this is how children saw lions in those days. That was a 10-year-old um, who, who did that. Here's another rather sad-looking lion. Children had a very specific image of lions, but Joy bringing along uh, more friendly lions gave us this splendid collection where you see now, suddenly, the lions are all smiling. Christopher Nichols, aged eight, just coming up to retirement age, <laughs> he's 58 now. That I don't think we'd have seen happy lions like that uh, without Elsa's story uh, being so well known. The story of the relationship between Joy Adamson and Elsa was inducing a new friendlier attitude towards wild animals. They'd shed their savage image from earlier colonial times when they were feared and hunted. Instead, they were being attributed with personalities and individual characteristics that had previously been reserved for pets. Even with the same feelings as humans, a tendency known as anthropomorphism, something which many accused Joy of doing. What the Adamsons had done was to take an animal and rear it to become equipped to hunt in the wild and then that animal had voluntarily come back and bought the cubs to show to the foster parents. Now in that very sentence is anthropomorphic. How do I know that she bought back those cubs in order to show to the foster parents? How do I know that it was her foster parents that she thought had to see her, her baby? I don't and neither did Joy but Joy believed that was so. From the afternoon, she bought the cups across the river. She was definitely very, very proud of them and loved them. But the fact was that she said, well, now here I am with my family. I'm coming, bring it to you. But giving animals emotions like pride and love was seen as inappropriate by scientists of the time. When Born Free was published, the prevailing scientific view was that animals only had instincts and conditioned reflexes and weren't capable of having individual will. Much of the scientific community felt that Joy Adamson's observations, lacking academic rigor, proved nothing. But this new thinking that animals could have individual feelings was beginning to inform some scientific research. One scientist in particular wanted to formalize the study of animal behavior, Dr. Lewis Leakey. Along with his wife, Mary, their discoveries of primate fossils rewrote the history on the origins of mankind. Being a paleoanthropologist, Leakey sought to establish an evolutionary connection between apes and mankind by linking their behavior. One of his methods for doing this was to send female field researchers out into the wild to observe and document animal behavior. The first was Jane Goodall, who studied chimps. She was soon followed by Diane Fossey, studying gorillas, and Baruti Gildikas, studying orangutans. Like Joy Adamson, Leakey's angels, as they were known, weren't scientists either, at least not when they started. I think he wanted them to be as open-minded and as unblinkered as possible while he did direct their research um, and then got them enlisted into universities. Um, so they certainly were taken into the scientific community. But because they came from a non-scientific background, they pushed at the, at the limits of what was acceptable. 
Like Joy, Jane Goodall also gave names to the animals she was studying. This act alone was met with fierce disapproval from academics and scientists. They were used to only giving the animals they were observing a number. But Jane persisted with her work, and along with other field researchers, they started to formalize the observation of wild animals. Slowly, scientific thinking began to change about animal behavior, revealing intriguing insights. We saw that certainly in the advanced animals, there were intelligent ones and kind of less intelligent ones, and there were aggressive ones and there were cowardly ones, or that's a moral term, but less cowardly, <laughs> less aggressive. Um, and, and that had a huge effect, I think, on, on zoological science. And now I think we do have a much more measured and accurate and, and uh, profound understanding of, of animal life because we recognize that there are individuals within the society, and of course I'm talking now about the higher animals, about the more complex ones. But that has been a very useful corrective. Now that both the scientific community and public accepted wild animals had individual characteristics, this raised many philosophical questions about how they should be treated. It used to be acceptable to confine animals in small cages, but with this new thinking, such practices became highly questionable. The research that has come out on animal intelligence has led us really to the point where we have to question what are animals rights what rights should they have and the changing attitudes towards animals fueled a whole new conservation movement which was quite different from a kind of more old colonial idea of we'll put this land aside because it's a good hunting reserve for us but for the first time animals were being protected for their own sake and there was this sense that they had as much right to live on this earth as we do. The book of Born Free had already contributed to this emerging consciousness but this was only the start what would ultimately turn it into a global movement for conservation was when Hollywood got hold of it in 1966. The feature film of Born Free starred the married couple of Bill Travers and Virginia McKenna. To make the story realistic, they were going to have to replicate the relationship that Joy and George Adamson had with Elsa, but on a much larger scale and on hand to help them forge these relationships with the film lions was the original George. It was decided right at the beginning when we were doing the film in this new way that George Adamson and ourselves and the lionesses would be free and the crew would be in cages with the camera. Now there are very sensible reasons for that. We were the ones that had to establish the relationship with the animal it worked really well. In the end we had over 20 animals of varying ages and sizes. Probably about four, four or five were animals that we had to get to know quite well as individuals. I think we really did have a glimpse of what could be established between um, a human being and a wild creature, particularly a dangerous wild creature like a carnivore, like a lion. This novel approach to filming was enormously successful and brought the story of Born Free to a whole new audience of millions. But it would have a more direct effect on its stars who would become evangelists for a whole conservation movement. In the movie, Elsa was released back into the wild but the reality of what happened to the film lions was entirely different. After shooting had finished, all of them were to be sold off to zoos around the world so that the producers could recoup some of the production costs. To Bill Travers and Virginia McKenna, this was a complete betrayal of what the Born Free story was all about. They lobbied hard to have all of the lions released into the wild. 
Eventually, the producers relented. Three of the film lions, Boy, Girl and Ugas, were sent to George's camp in Meru to start their rehabilitation. Stirred by what had happened, Bill and Virginia made their first documentary about the film lions they'd worked with. Bill was going off to Meru to George's tiny little camp to make his first documentary and I stayed at home feeling quite envious, I have to say, that he was off having all that fun, although loving being with the children, it wasn't that. It's just, you know, I felt so much part of the story, it was quite hard to be left behind. But I wasn't really left behind because he phoned me whenever he could, not very successfully. Is that you, Bill? Call Bill. No, it's all right, I can't... Bill! You, you keep fading, darling. I'm sorry if we keep fading, but I'm making a radio telephone call from Meru. After The Lions Are Free, Bill and Virginia made a feature film about an elephant in Kenya called Pole Pole, which went to London Zoo after filming was finished. In 1983, when she died in captivity, after a botched attempt to move her, the Travers decided it was time to do more than just make films. They set up a charity to focus on why wild animals should no longer be kept in captivity and campaigned to close the worst zoos. Initially called Zoo Check, the name was changed to the Born Free Foundation in 1991, with a broadened focus across a range of animal species, from dolphins to giraffes. It's now been going for over 25 years, and to celebrate, they're having a star-studded fundraiser at the Albert Hall. The charity is run by Bill Travers and Virginia McKenna's son, Will. He's experienced firsthand how the meaning of the name, Born Free, has changed from the publication of the book 50 years ago. Born Free is a brand, but what we've got is a brand with value and a pedigree and a heritage. It goes all the way back to the book, it goes all the way through the film, it goes all the way through the foundation for 25 years. And so I think people who know about animals or care about animals, when they hear the word born free, even if they don't really know what we do, they know what we stand for. In the 50 years since Born Free was published, the Adamsons have become legends in the conservation movement. And Virginia holds the friendships she had with both of them very dear. It was 10 days ago that um, I was standing next to Elsa's grave. The first time that I stood there was in 1965 with Joy Adamson. She invited me to go for three days and really just experience her emotions about this animal, about which she felt so deeply. After I'd been standing at Elsa's grave, I then went to George's first little camp in Meru, where he started his lion rehabilitation work with our three lions from Born Free. But you don't really need the concrete or rusty metal things. You only have to remember the man and the spirit, and that's really fine. He was such a good friend, and Bill and I both treasured his friendship so much. And um, I thought he was an extraordinary man and the proof of it that his lands loved him. If you're loved by a wild animal, that says something for you. Some of the descendants of these original film lions can still be seen in Meru National Park today. Oh my goodness. There is a chance that some of the lions that you see in Meru here are descendants of Girl. And Girl was one of the lands that was in Born Free. And we know that Girl had cubs. <laughs> 
And uh, so these could be, could be descendants of hers. I like to think that. They'll never cease to impress me, and uh, I just think they're the most wonderful species of animal. I love all animals, but obviously I feel a bit of a special feeling for lions because of born free. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, the public's attitude towards keeping animals in captivity changed. Cheaper air travel, combined with a desire to see animals in the wild, created a multi-billion pound tourist industry. This income is often held up as offering a solution to many conservation issues, but some see this as being a bit simplistic. One of the things that Born Free did was contribute to a set of ideas about African wildlife uh, in the minds of people in Europe and North America. It set an image of Africa as, a, as a, a wild place full of amazing animals where people could go and have close relations with those amazing animals of sort of friendship. And that essentially was never a true picture of the relations between people and wildlife in Africa. And it isn't a helpful basis for constructing conservation. The money that that sort of tourism generates has to go through a lot of hands before it trickles back to uh, poor rural African people. And usually very little of that gets into the hands of local people. So there is a sense that protected areas, game reserves, national parks, national reserves, are a playground for European tourists. There can be no doubt that tourist money helps sustain conservation areas like Meru and other reserves. But to attract this kind of money, tourists want to see the big game of Africa, and lions especially. This raises concerns because it can focus conservation efforts on large charismatic animals and often doesn't take the whole of biodiversity into account. It's about protecting the fierce, the rare, the dramatic which is not anymore particularly helpful. And so the efforts that go into protecting particular individuals of particular rare species may be very good in an animal welfare sense, but it isn't delivering conservation of living diversity across East Africa in a very complete way. An alternative view is that by focusing on charismatic animals at the top of the food chain, the whole ecosystem benefits. There is great value attached to individual stories. We can follow the story of an animal, as it were, from birth to death. So if we follow individuals, we can expand on the wider issues involved and then become hopefully part of the solution. As fierce debates about conservation continue, they show how the story of Born Free took on a life of its own, separate from Joy and George Adamson. But while this was going on, they continued to live out their own lives, but without the Hollywood happy ending. In the mid-sixties, the Adamsons were both still living in Meru, but in separate camps on opposite sides of the park. Joy had raised and released a cheetah called Pippa, successfully replicating the same remarkable relationship that she'd had with Elsa. Even though Elsa had died several years before, Joy believed that sometimes she was still guiding her work. Obviously, I had to be very careful not to be regarded as a crank. And I'm not a crank, I don't think so. My friends at least don't make me feel I'm a crank and so on. But it is something which I have no comparing in others. But there is a force in me which uh, um, sometimes works through me as if some, something dictates me to do. And I'm just the kind of uh, interpreter, medium. Joy wrote two books about her experiences with Pippa. These, along with Born Free and its sequels, continued to make millions for Joy's wildlife appeal. She used much of this money to help set up four national parks and reserves in Kenya, including Meru. While Joy was with Pippa the Cheetah, George was continuing to rehabilitate and release lions back into the wild. <laughs> 
His work with the three original film lions, Boy, Girl and Ugas, initially went well. But it wasn't to last. The Adamsons were extraordinarily naive in what they were trying to achieve. I mean, the idea that you can raise lion cubs and um, basically get them to lose their fear of humans and then release them into the wild or into a reserve where there are humans nearby, um, which make then very easy prey, um, is, is extremely foolish. I think George was perfectly well aware um, that releasing lions in the wild uh, was an extremely dangerous occupation. There is no such thing as a totally safe land. He knew that, but he believed on balance uh, that it was not criminally irresponsible to let loose these creatures. He probably did underestimate the dangers. In 1969, his favourite lion, Boy, attacked a child sitting in a car. Boy should have been shot for this, but he escaped a death sentence and had to be moved out of Meru instead. George eventually found a new home for Boy in central Kenya at Kora. Here, his project could start up afresh. He set up camp with his assistant, Stanley, but it wasn't long before Boy attacked again. Early on the morning of the 6th June, my cook, Kimani, came into the hut and said that boy had just arrived. A few minutes later, Kimani had come in to clear the table, when suddenly, both of us heard cries from the bush behind the camp. I grabbed my rifle and ran to the back gate of the compound. I saw boy with Stanley in his jaws. As I rushed at him, he dropped Stanley and moved further into the bush. I ran a few paces past Stanley and shot Boy through the heart. In a few moments I was back with Stanley. As I started to examine his wounds, he died. Shooting Boy was the hardest thing George had ever had to do, and it deeply affected him. His diary entry that night reveals how he felt. Lions very quiet. They know something has happened. Boy, my old friend, farewell. Following Stanley's death, George needed to find an assistant. The answer came from the East End of London in Tony Fitzjohn, who would become George's right hand man. Here's the Cora boundary, we're just coming in now. Tony left here over 20 years ago, but he's now been invited back by the Kenya Wildlife Service to look at rehabilitating the park so that tourists will visit. I live with a guy old enough to be my grandfather for 20 years. I'm going back to Cora now, the same age he was when I joined him. That's very weird. There is a threat of Somali bandits in the area, so the Kenya Wildlife Service keeps an armed presence to stop incursions. Karibu, karibu, karibu. Uh, karibu, karibu, karibu. How are you? Good, nice yes. seeing you again. Can we have a ride to camp, please? Tony first arrived at the camp after being picked up from the nearest town by George's brother. With no previous experience, he was about to get thrown to the lions and start to help George rehabilitate them back into the wild. And I came in through the main gate and then George came out of the mess and there was a lioness pacing up and down the wire calling and just everything felt right. And I just thought, this is extraordinary. 
I remember a couple of weeks later, George turning around and saying, you know, well, how long do you think you can stay? And I said, I don't know, about 10, 12 years, I guess. So he was, he was kind of stuck with me. When George and I had perfected our methods of getting these lions back, we were running up to 16, 17 lions at a time in three different prides. I mean, that took some juggling and that took some amazing work. We probably did that work so well because so few people ever came here. We just left alone to do it on our own. There wasn't anyone to distract from that. Since Elsa had died in 1961, Joy and George had spent increasing amounts of time apart, and by the 1970s, they were effectively separated. I never really understood it. I think there was a lot of, you know, decent old gent stuff in there where he'd never admit that they were separated. They were just doing their separate things. But every time she came here, he gets so upset, you know, and she creates such a stir that it was obvious that they were completely incompatible. George was now firmly established up in the wilderness of Cora, and Joy had moved on to rehabilitating a leopard called Penny. Everybody thought that she'd taken on too much this time. Leopards are seen as much more unpredictable and dangerous than lions or cheetahs. While working with her, she received several broken bones. Life in camp was also made hard for Joy because of her difficult personality and she wasn't getting on with her staff. She understood animals brilliantly, but she didn't understand people, and she didn't know how to handle people. Uh, she, she, she treated them <laughs> like a lioness would treat an interloper, and, and uh, people got a pretty rough time from her, I think. It was a hard and dangerous life, but by the end of 1979, She'd succeeded against everyone's expectations. Penny had just given birth to her first two cubs, and Joy had finished writing her book about the story. Every evening she went for a walk out of the camp uh, just before dark. But one night she failed to come back, and the South African assistant went to look for her and found about two or three hundred yards away her uh, body slashed and bleeding beside the track. He immediately radioed for help and said he thought that Joy had been killed by a lion. This led to a news flash going all the way around the world that Joy had been killed by a lion. And in a way, this might have been a poetic end to the story. A post-mortem revealed that she'd actually died from a knife wound. Her murderer was an ex-employee who she'd got into an argument with over money. In her books and films, and above all, in her influence, she will continue to extend upon all people of goodwill who care what happens to all of God's creatures. Joy was cremated and her ashes were divided between the graves of Pippa the Cheetah and her beloved Elsa. Although George didn't see any of the money from Born Free while Joy was alive, she did leave him £8,000 a year in her will. This, with his game warden's pension, continued to fund his lion project in Cora. In the 80s, his situation there was becoming increasingly dangerous. Just across the Tana River were Somali bandits who often poached the wildlife in Cora and sent George threats because they wanted the land he was on. George had been living with danger all his life and so he wasn't surprised when he heard that the Somalis who lived just across the frontier, close to the reserve where he was working, were out to get him. In 1986, his brother Terence died. And then in 1988, Tony left Cora to set up his own wildlife project in Tanzania. 
George's security was becoming compromised, as two of his most trusted people were no longer with him in camp. Then, in 1989, the almost inevitable happened. Good evening, the headlines at six o'clock. George Adamson, who spent nearly all his life working with wild animals in East Africa, has been shot dead at his home. It's believed he was murdered trying to save a friend from bandits. Someone who was staying at George's camp was being driven to the airport. The car was stopped by bandits. The bandits dragged the driver out because he was protesting and broke both his legs with an iron bar. And some shots were fired and then George heard them in the camp and drove up in his Land Rover with two men. So the car that was shot up on the way to the airstrip after the plane buzzed was right here. So it was parked on, off on the ditch. George came down and sort of slowed down a bit and almost stopped. The three Somalis were taking in turns with the lady on the, over the front of the car and George saw this and got really angry. And he must have known he didn't stand much of a chance. It was a bit of a suicide run, wasn't it? So he came down firing the pistol out of the window of his car and he got to about here and they were shooting him in the front and the front of the car and the front of the car and they must have hit him a couple of times but it didn't kill him and just when he was about level with them is when he started to lose control of the car and he veered off the road right here and went off into the bush and the shot that actually killed him was when they were firing at him from behind um, and, a, and a shot went in through his spine at the bank. In the ensuing confusion, the girl George had come to help managed to escape. He wouldn't have objected to that death. He wouldn't have wanted to go to an old people's home and you know, have it pushed around in a wheelchair. And although it was terrible that he was actually killed, he died in the place where his heart was. The funeral took place in Cora a couple of days later. George's murder was reported all over the Western world and dozens of people flew in to pay their last respects. His murder also provoked an uncompromising response from the Kenyan Wildlife Service. Their then head, Richard Leakey, enforced a shoot-to-kill policy for all poachers. The wildlife and security forces of this country will not be deterred by violence under any circumstances whatsoever. Beyond that, I think perhaps... Also, Cora was designated as a Kenyan national park, a fitting legacy for George's work. The main thing is what George believed in, the philosophy and the work is carried on by Tony and that's what really matters. Since George's funeral, no new lions have been released in Cora. But there are now plans to start up their rehabilitation on the reserve once again. We are in collaboration with the George Adamson Wildlife Trust being headed by Tony Fitzjohn, fundraising for Cora, rehabilitating Cora, rehabilitating first the George Adamson's camp, what we call Cambia Simba, where he used to live. Tony and the Kenyan Wildlife Service are under no illusions that this will be a difficult and dangerous job, not least because of poachers and bandits still in the area. We are fighting the war against anybody who is against wildlife and conservation. So I can say we are playing a great role. 
and we are proud of that. Conservation was first introduced into Kenya by the British colonial government and continued after independence in 1963 when Africans started to take control of their own wildlife. Today there are initiatives to teach the next generation about conservation issues and Born Free has a role in this as well. At Joy's old home on Lake Naivasha, there is now a field study centre for school children. Elsa was a lioness, and mare for us here means near water. Here they learn about their wildlife, and it is on this new generation of African children that the future of conservation in Kenya will rely. It all started out as two people's experiment to see if they could rehabilitate an orphaned lion cub back into the wild. From these small beginnings, its influence can still be felt far and wide. So how does Born Free, the story of Elsa, how does it fit into the history of the 20th century's changing attitudes towards animals? Um, I think the answer is that it it gave it a boost. People were beginning to see animals as partners, if you like, with humans on this small planet, and not as um, simply uh, us and them, but that we were all together in this problem of how this planet was going to survive. Born Free played an important role in showing how wild animals could no longer be seen as a commodity but should be recognized as individuals that deserved their own rights. You have the mindset that has changed, that millions of people who do not regard lions, for example, as you know bloodthirsty killers, but regard lions as creatures with personalities, with desires, with needs. And I think that is the most phenomenal legacy from, from two people and a cub in the bush in the 1950s. This cultural shift helped spawn a global conservation movement that is still going strong. The positive impact that Born Free's had since it was published can be in little doubt. But 50 years on, the issues facing conservation have inevitably changed. It's hugely to the Adamsons' credit, Joy and George, Taking that popularity and that income, after all, and that huge surge of feeling, they allowed it to be taken into uh, fueling the conservation movement in general, and that should never be minimised. But I would hope that as we continue, the zeitgeist that enabled that to happen uh, has become a little more sophisticated, uh, so that now people realise that the natural world is more complex than that and that our relationship with the natural world is more complex than that.